Dr. Brian Whedon, Director of Program Planning with Secure World Foundation. Thanks for joining us on Australia in Space TV. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We're off the back of Secure World Foundation's Space Sustainability Summit in New York. We were pleased to be media partners and we spoke to Dr. Peter Martinez uh, last uh, in that context as well. Director of Program Planning, uh, Secure World Foundation is, is doing a range of different things uh, and your background and your antecedents uh, is quite astounding as well. So we're going to uh, discuss security in space. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different stuff I'd like to cover with you. But yeah, just some of your key programs uh, in your role with Secure World Foundation in this context. Sure, happy to provide some input there. So my official title is Director of Program Planning. I oversee the foundation's process for putting together our annual budget of all the different projects we're working on, and all the different things we're, what we're doing. Um, within that, my actual work and expertise focuses on multiple areas. I work on a lot of our security issues, and in particular, how things like potential conflict in outer space and a satellite testing, proliferation of counterfeit weapons, how all of those things could jeopardize long-term sustainability of space or, or create other challenges. Um, I also have a technical background. Uh, my, my last job in the US Air Force was with the unit that tracks all the stuff in space. So I had sort of an operational mission of, of that, what is up there, what's in space, what we know. So I also support a lot of our work on orbital debris, how do we understand the debris populations? What are some of the policy strategies we should put in place to minimize the creation of debris and eventually remove existing debris? Uh, and then I also have another angle where I provide um, kind of public policy guidance across a whole wide range of things, uh, including oversight of future commercial space activities. Well, you have formerly mentioned the Air Force, US Strategic Command's Joint Space Operations Center there. How have you found that transition from Air Force to the private sector, given that knowledge, and particularly when yeah. you're talking about space situational awareness? Uh, yeah, is that was that a challenge or something you find that you needed to, to sort of break away from? Uh, it, it definitely was a challenge. Uh, when I first left, uh, a little side note, my wife was a major in the Cadian Air Force, and we got married, at, and, and it became really complicated after that. Her next assignment was in Montreal, Canada, and there's not a lot of jobs there for a former Air Force uh, space and nuke guy. So I originally left the Air Force in 2007, moved to Montreal, and was a stay-at-home dad-to-be for <laughs> several months. Um, but then I, I got hired on to Secure World as a debris, space situation awareness, technical expert to start supporting our initial work on those areas. And, and I've stuck around ever since. So, you know, it's been 15 years, which is long enough to, to be able to do that transition. Um, but it, it was definitely was challenging, right? You, you know, being in the military, you get exposed to some really deep technical knowledge and, and, and you know, uh, what we call operations, right? You know, kind of doing things. And while they're really useful skills, it's always a, a transition of how how are you going to translate those to the civilian world? You know, your your resume in the military looks nothing like a resume yeah. uh, in the civilian world. And it was just interesting, you know, 2015, uh, uh, my uh, my wife transitioned. So she retired from the Canadian forces and had her own transition to the civilian world. You know, and I was able to kind of help her out a little bit in that process. But I think it's been good. I, you know, I got some hands-on experience with, you know, the people that have the most experience and expertise in tracking all the stuff in Earth orbit. Uh, I was doing that job through some pretty interesting events, including the 2007 uh, Chinese anti-satellite test. Um, and and, and I, I found it invaluable, that kind of ex real world experience for what I'm doing now in the policy world. Well, then you, yeah, you did your PhD in public policy and, and public administration. How much advocacy do you think is needed globally within the space debris challenge? Uh, and how optimistic are you that it's solvable? Yeah. Your, so, laugh, uh, your, your laugh does not make me comfortable. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the PhD program, again, was also invaluable. Uh, look, a lot of people in our world don't even know what policy means, right? And uh, it, it is simply how governments choose or not choose how to address a particular problem whether that is poverty or climate change or a national security context. 
Uh, and public administration is how the governments organize themselves mm. to implement or, or address those, those issues. So it was great and giving me a lot of really good conceptual tools, uh, theoretical frameworks, uh, you know, qualitative, quantitative methodolo method methodologies for better understanding problems, or just really good stuff to kind of then bring to bear on this issue. You know, we started working on the issue of space sustainability and orbital debris within Secure World back in 2008 time period. And over the last 15 years, I think we've seen a lot of success in raising awareness about the issue. Okay. Everyone's talking about it. Lots of people concerned about it. You know, many countries have national policies or standards or regulations that are trying to address it. Uh, the United Nations, uh, as in 2019, approved a set of, uh, of guidelines for fostering space sustainability, including dealing with orbital debris. So I think largely the awareness raising is over. Now it becomes a really hard part over what do we do about it. And, and in that case, we still have quite a lot of lot to do. There are some areas where we have clear science and data about what needs to be done. Uh, things like minim, uh, what we call debris mitigation guidelines, right? So minimizing the creation of new debris. Uh, and there's some progress in implementing those. Other areas like remediation or removal of, of what's already up there. Um, that is something that we have a lot more work to do. Uh, there's sort of, there's a general understanding there's uh, of what needs to be done, but not a lot of governments are funding that. There, there haven't been any demonstration missions. Um, there's a long ways to go. So that's where I think our, our biggest focus is going to be on. And honestly, at the end of the day, it comes down to how do you, how do you motivate governments and companies to take action and not just talk about these problems? And, you know, honestly, there's a lot of parallels there with what's going on with climate change, you know, right down here on Earth. It is one of those things of security is often not thought about until after the, an incident actually happens. And uh, that that's only my concern is that they're going to wait until, oh, yeah. hang on, all the lights have gone out. So, yeah, we better go fix that now. Uh, and otherwise, it's not our problem uh, until we work it out. But you're actually working on this at the moment. NASA's um, provided some funding. There's three university project teams. Uh, analyzing the economic, social policy issues associated with space sustainability, yep. and you've got that. Maybe talk us where that project is uh, and who you're working with. So for the last couple of years, uh, NASA has had a grant that called ROSES, and it's a, an acronym that's usually supporting policy, sustainability, economic aspects of space debris kinds of issues. Uh, and, and last year, we were part of a team that included the University of Colorado Boulder um, and Middlebury College uh, that got a grant to study a, a particular aspect of this. There, there are models of how space debris is created and the population now grows over time. And in other domains, there are models of economic behavior that says, if you do this, if you, you know, build a new road or you raise the speed limit or you, you do something else, here's how people might react. There's nothing really that marries those two things together. So what this project is doing is seeing can we tie together a astrodynamic model of the space environment and the debris populations with a economic behavior model of actors in space to then be able to test certain policy ideas? What happens if we take the standard, you know, 20, we call the 25 year rule for how, much, how long you can leave debris on orbit and bump it down to five? What happens if we put in place mandatory maneuvering above a certain altitude? Um, what happens if you put in place bonds or, or something, some other kind of economic incentive? Mm. Uh, because, you know, in a lot of other domains, we've discovered that people don't always react the way you think they're going to react. Yep. You know, there's lots of studies that, you know, here in the United States on, you know, you build more roads and you end up with more traffic because it incents mm. more people to drive. And that happens faster than you can build the new roads. Uh, so, so those are the kind of things we're hoping to get to. Now, this is a, a relatively small grant. Uh, we're doing basically a pilot of, is it possible to marry these two models together and, and maybe do some, some test outputs? Uh, but yeah, we hope to have results uh, towards the fall of this year, end of this year. Well, I'll have the link in the show notes, but there's uh, two others, Adaptive Space Governance and Decision Support Using Source Sync Evolutionary Environmental Models. The other one is Communication and Space Debris, Connecting the Public uh, Knowledges and Identities. And uh, I mentioned that one with you is an, an integrated assessment model for satellite constellations and orbital debris 
Uh, and that's with uh, the Middlebury College, University of Colorado Boulder and Secure World Foundation is obviously involved with that as well. So uh, it looks very interesting. How do you find uh, sort of moving forward and over the next decade, it's forecast you know, some 50 to 100,000 uh, new satellites, low Earth orbit. Is that going to be manageable, just low Earth orbit? Or is it sort of the middle Earth? Is uh, Where is that key challenge? Uh, and, and is everyone following the rules? <laughs> yeah, a lot to unpack there. Um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> you know, w w w when I was doing this job uh, back in the Air Force in, in the early 2000s, there were something that, you know, maybe 1,100 active satellites. And as mm. you mentioned at the moment, we're up to 8,500 and, you know, may end up in 50,000 plus in the next five to 10 years. That's a that's a massive growth. Um, on the one hand, I think if you said 10 years ago that, you know, we're going to have a constellation of four and a half thousand satellites operated by one actor in space. People, are like, that's crazy. It's never going to happen. Well, it's happening. Um, and to their credit, Starlink, uh, SpaceX operates Starlink constellation. They're doing a really good job of managing that. They're doing tens of thousands of autonomous uh, maneuvers to uh, reduce the possibility or probability of collision. Uh, and, and that's something, again, we didn't think was possible. But the question is, how does that continue, right? Now that there's two operators or three operators mm. or four operators, and they each have their own constellations and they each have their own autonomous decision-making system, how do those systems interact with each other? There's a lot of unanswered questions. And then there's questions about light pollution. There's questions about radio frequency interference. There's questions about the potential impact of all of that stuff, in particular the metals, the aluminum, re-entering the atmosphere and burning up in, in the very upper atmosphere and any kind of impact that might be there. We haven't studied that issue at all. So I'll honestly say we don't know. And that's what's really hard about this, right? It's it's not like we know exactly what's going to happen and therefore we can design policies and strategies to mitigate the worst effects. We just don't know what those are going to be. And unfortunately, as you sort of got to it, we may not know until they're already happening, which is honestly the case in a lot of other areas. And, it, um, and it's been driven by the civil sector as well, without any policy or regulatory guidelines at all, right? Well, there, there, there has been quite a lot of work. There, there's been a lot of discussion of these issues. Um, within the United States, uh, the FCC started a program. The, they're, the Federal Communications Commission is the entity that licenses all of these large constellations uh, for radio frequency use. And, and they've been the primary entity looking at this. They started something in 2018, so five years ago, uh, on what they call orbital debris mitigation in the new space age. And the question they asked was, do the existing standards for debris mitigation that apply to one or two or a handful of satellites at a time, are those sufficient for the large constellations or are there new issues here? And, and over those five years, there were multiple rounds of public comments from industry, from think tanks, from academia, um, hearings, there's been back and forth, and they've actually made some changes. Uh, for example, all these constellations are now required to bring down their satellites within five years at the end of life. Previously, it was 25 years. So that, that's a pretty significant change. Uh, they also, when they make their applications, they have to provide paperwork to demonstrate they're going to satisfy uh, a certain level of, of, of probability of collision, right? That they're not going to create collisions in space. Uh, and then there's also a lot of work they have to do on what's call design for demise. So when their satellites re-enter, making sure nothing is going to survive that re-entry that might create a hazard for things in Earth. So there are things in place, but it's not comprehensive. There are no policies or regulations on light pollution, what we talked about earlier with yeah. the current quiz, dark and quiet skies. That's just something we've never thought about before. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a new issue. I hadn't, and I hadn't thought about yeah. the materials and the fuel that they use uh, yeah. as well is uh, the fuel is generally okay. Yeah. Um, it's either uh, uh, xenon or krypton, something like that, a noble gas, usually what they use for fuel. Um, that's not generally the challenge The you know, the aluminum oxides from the reentering the atmosphere, that could be an issue. But again, no one's ever studied this. We don't have any data. We don't have any science. So we just don't really know what's going on there. Um, so, so anyways, it, I, I wouldn't say there's nothing out there. 
and no one is thinking about this. There certainly are entities that are thinking about this. We have also had a couple of roundtables with uh, space and spectrum regulators from multiple countries around the world so they can talk to each other about how they're approaching these issues, what kinds of concerns they have. Um, that's been really useful. Uh, we're, we're also doing some work on this issue of orbital carrying capacity. Is there a certain limit to how much stuff you can put into space or in a certain orbit altitude? Um, the answer is we don't know, <laughs> in part because there's like 10 different ways to define what that carrying capacity is or measure it. And, and there's, a, there's about a dozen groups all around the world, different universities that are actively researching and working on that. And we're sort of helping coordinate some of that and, and helping then take some of those risk findings and, and bring them in front of regulators. So people are absolutely thinking about this. Um, but we just, there's just a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, and, and that's why you haven't seen a lot of, uh, I would say, definitive kind of comprehensive regulations or changes. And maybe just as a close on that, and, uh, and and thanks for that overview, I suppose that's where the importance of Secure World Foundation and the work that you do and the Space Sustainability Summit that you just held in New York. Any any takeaways from there? Was there sort of out of those discussions and, and people in the room, uh, sort of low-hanging fruit for you that you would say were a takeaway? Yeah, you know, our goal with the summit every year is to bring together the broader space sustainability community because it's more than just debris. It's more than just space traffic management. It's It also includes the aspects of conflict in space. It includes discussions about, you know, future lunar activities and what's going to happen there. And we try to look at that whole picture and we try to bring that whole community together to see what everybody else is doing. And honestly, that's that's one of the big things that, that I think we did well this year. Um, I had I, I talked to a couple of people that attended that said, you know, I don't know anybody else here. And that's awesome because, you know, we're breaking down those silos and we're bringing people together that may not get a chance to interact with other communities. One thing I felt was, was important this year is uh, I had uh, the pleasure to do uh, a, a keynote chat with uh, Lieutenant General John Shaw, who is the deputy commander of U.S. Space Command. And, you know, had a chance to ask him flat out, you know, what does the U.S. military, what does U.S. Space Command think of these issues? And he confirmed, he says, yeah, we, we care about space sustainability because they're actors in space. Mm. Um, and, and I thought that was an important viewpoint that people are not always here, right? That, that you know, the U.S. military operates a lot of satellites. And they're worried about protecting the, those satellites. Uh, I think also this year we had a big focus on connecting what's going on in the space world to the broader set of global challenges, uh, things that are going on in the UN, discussions that are happening on the Summer for the Future next year. That I thought was really good. And, um, you know, trying to keep that perspective that it's not, we're not doing space just for space, right? We're doing space because of those benefits space can provide to addressing global challenges right here on Earth. And I think we had a lot of good discussions about that. Uh, and, and that also generated a whole bunch of ideas, I know, for us of things we need to work on for next year and, and, and other things that, that are that we should be focusing on. Wonderful. Well, look, I could I've got about 10 other questions in the back of my mind because uh, you mentioned space military and, and and those type of things. I think we'll leave the audience wanting more. Uh, we'll have some links in the show notes as well. Uh, and this obviously links off to uh, some of our articles that we had from the summit itself, uh, as well as our interview with Peter Martinez. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Crystal uh, in Perth later this year for the uh, Space and Earth Conference uh, as well, which I'll give a quick plug, uh, 23rd to the 24th of October uh, in Western Australia. But uh, Dr. Brian Whedon, Director of Program Planning with Secure World Foundation there in Washington, thank you very much for joining us today on Australia in Space TV. It was my pleasure. Thank you.